Welcome to Unrestrain, the podcast series from CPI. Here you can enjoy conversations where professionals on all sides of crisis and behavior management relax and open up about themselves, their workplace, and their clients. You'll get the latest tips and trends from the best in the business, so tune in often to integrate their experiences with your own. Hello and welcome to Unrestrained, a CPI podcast series. This is your host, Terry Vitone, and today we're headed for Points North. My guest this morning is Trudy Metcalf. Until her recent retirement, Trudy was a parenting program coordinator at the Ottawa Inuit Children's Center and a CPI certified instructor. She is an Inuk, that's singular for Inuit, woman, originally from Nain, Nunat Siavut, the most northern community on the coast of the province of Newfoundland and Labrador in eastern Canada. Throughout her life and professional career, she has been a passionate advocate for the Inuit community. During our interview today, we'll talk about Trudy's upbringing and career, including her experience as a CPI certified instructor and all the ways she has worked for and with the Inuit community. All right, Trudy, to begin today, first of all, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, uh, so anxious to read the good stuff about you that I didn't greet you. Sorry for that. To begin today, could you tell our listeners about your upbringing? I understand your father was in you and, and he was relocated by the government. Um, could you talk about how and why that happened and the primary issues facing the community in which you were raised? Uh, yes. So my father was uh, in Oki. He passed away about 18 years ago. He was born um, in a very small community of maybe just I think there was maybe seven, seven to ten families in a place that's now going into the, um, it's being recognized as a National Historic Site in Canada, in Hebron, uh, Labrador. Um, that was north of Maine. So when, when, those communi- when those families were relocated to Southern Points, some of them were, re- were relocated to Maine, others were relocated to other communities in the area. And that, and my understanding is a part of the reason for relocation for a lot of Inuit was uh, part of it was sovereignty purposes uh, for the government of, uh, government of Canada for northern lands. Part of it was also when the government uh, made the decision that they're going to be, well, because of the sovereignty, and now we have Inuit living on these lands, the government of Canada became responsible for the Inuit in a sense. And getting supplies and... I guess, services to all of these little communities, people living on the land. You, when, when you're living on the land like 70, 80, 100 years ago, there were outpost camps. So there might be, you know, three or four families living in one area, and then further along there might be three or four other families. Inuit we were, were nomads, right? We followed the animals. Hebron was a Moravian missionary camp that was basically run by the Moravian missionaries who came over in the 1700s, I believe it was. And when it became, or when it was recognized that, like, I, it's hard, to, it's hard to, to figure out why the decision was made to relocate Hebron itself. My thinking is it was very hard to get to, uh, which is part of the reason why people were moved to communities further south. When my father was relocated, his family, he was 11 years old, uh, and they were relocated to Maine. There were other people re- relocated to communities like Makovic, Mo- Mo- and I'm not sure what other communities along the coast of Labrador. Uh, so he was 11, which would have meant that would have been probably around the 19... 19- I don't quite know when he was born. <laughs> I never ever stopped to think about his birth date. So he died in 2000. He was about 60 years old. Okay. So 50 years before that. So he was probably born in the 40s and relocated in the 50s. And what do you remember? And, about, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, uh, just no, go ahead. I don't know what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, um, I just wondered what, uh, what it was like as a girl growing up. What do you remember most about your childhood? I mean, what were your favorite things in, in the environment that you were raised in? Uh, so I was raised in Maine, Labrador. I was actually born in Northwest River because a lot of these communities also don't have, like, hospitals, for example. There's nowhere for parents to give birth. So uh, moms would be uh, sent out to whatever, wherever the nearest hospital was. In my case, with my birth, my mother was shipped to Northwest River, which was a little further south. And then we would go back home after I was born, for example. So born in Northwest River, raised in Maine until I was about six and a half, almost seven years old. And even though I was only there for six years, for it's always 
for me, it's always been my home, even though I spent more time growing up in northern Newfoundland. When we, when we uh, moved to northern Newfoundland, my mom and dad separated when I was um, about that age. And I went to be with my mom in her hometown, but I always consider Maine my home. My greatest memories are from Maine. They're the ones that I remember, I recall. I remember like spending time with my grandfather. Um, I remember our dog team, for example. I remember walking to school and, you know, we would get Sesame Street on a on an old film reel once a week. Our, play, wow. our mail was delivered by either airplane, like a float plane type thing, mm-hmm. or brought in on the ships in the summertime. Our, I remember my mom working at the processing plant. We also owned what would have been the local kind of grocery store um, where I would <laughs> see all these treats and stuff on the on the shelves but know that I wasn't allowed to have them because they were for sale. They weren't just for us to go and have, for example. No, that's hard on a kid. Yeah, I remember going to, you know, church on Sundays, uh, being picked up by by the, uh, like, Reverend Hatash, who was the minister when I was growing up there and being picked up, like, he was, he had one of the only vehicles in town. He had a Jeep, and he would drive around and pick up the kids, let's say, for Sunday school on Sundays, and he also had hens, so we could go and pick eggs, for example. Um, my fault. Fa- we also had, uh, my father was the first mayor of Maine, so he was also part of that. He had a vehicle, but the vehicle was for, was the garbage truck. Huh. So, growing up there, we didn't have a lot of vehicles. More people had skidoos or dog teams. Mm-hmm. And you had a dog um, team? I remember. Yeah. How, so many, we how, had a, how many dogs is there? Uh, I'm not sure, but I'm going to guess. Most dog teams, I mean, I don't recall exactly because we weren't allowed to, a dog team, the dogs for dog teams are not pets, and uh-huh. they only have one master, and that would have been my father. I see. So I'm going to say it would probably have been maybe 10 to ten to 13 or 14 dogs. Mm. And they would be used for hunting, right? So that's how he would hunt for our food. He would go seal hunting with the dog teams and a comatic, like, um, being pulled behind the dog teams, like the sled. Uh-huh. And further on, like, maybe like, skidoos, right? We started getting skidoos, let's say. So the dog teams would be replaced by skidoos, partially um, the dog slaughter, right? That there was there was a period in history where uh, Inuit dog teams were slaughtered. So... That was a way for there to be more control over the Inuit and taking away their means of survival, in a sense, without being dependent on government uh, funding things and stuff like that. But I, I do recall us having a skidoo growing up, an old, um, I think it was a Bombardier, uh, like the old yellow one with the black stripes oh, sure. on it. So I remember having that and... and then pulling our comatic behind that where we would sit on the sled to go out for rides and stuff like that. We didn't necessarily, as children, go on the hunts that young, but, um, you know, we do take um, people who, who do a lot of uh, subsistence off the land, their children do learn how to hunt at a very young age, I mean, as young as, in some cases, five, six, seven years old, and they're learning to hunt. And that's happening um, today? Yes. Mm-hmm. Wow. So kids are out and they're they're hunting at that age, and it's it's quite important to the Inuit culture to pass on those traditions, uh, not just because for food, but also it's it's just a way of life in the north for a lot of people. And do do you think that uh, there was? Uh, I'm wondering about the issues facing the communities in Maine. Was there a lot of hardship there for people? I, I don't know about in Maine itself. I mean, there's there's hardship in a lot of the communities just because of the high cost of food. Um, and, you know, a lot of people say, well, why don't they just move? And it's like, well, why would we have to move? But this, these are our homes, right? It's like, sure. it's, it's, it's just not right. And we can't just go necessarily to the grocery store to buy something because the prices are ridiculous. Mm. I remember seeing a posting um, at one point from Maine itself, actually, for a half of a watermelon. It was $54. Oh. For a half of a watermelon. That says a lot. Yeah, that's just an example. I mean, mm-hmm. um, a case of pop, let's say, for example, here in Ottawa, I can buy a case of pop for approximately 50 cents a can. Mm-hmm. Uh, in a lot of northern communities, that price is translating to anywhere from 3 to $5 a can. Wow. 
a case of water. We can go to the we can go to the store and buy a case of water for twenty four bottles for two or three dollars. I've seen prices for the same case of water for a hundred and six dollars. No. So I mean the cost of wheat. I, I actually was just looking on on Facebook and I saw somebody posted a steak for seventy one dollars. Hmm. A steak. <laughs> I, yes. That I can I, go to the grocery store and buy for maybe ten or twelve dollars, let's say. So because of that transportation and distance, and I think probably the opportunism of the people selling it, the prices just grow astronomical. Yeah, a lot of it is shipping cost, mm-hmm. but I, I, it's it's not that expensive. I mean, yes, it is expensive to ship things up north, especially when you're shipping it by air because it's going up on planes. There, there are planes that go into the main communities pretty much every day, but then from the main communities that it has to be shipped further to smaller communities. So the costs are... Some of them are justifiable, but mm-hmm. not to that extent. Right. So there's and some... there, it's it's been a bone of contention for a long time, and there's supposed to be nutrition north programs and stuff like that mm-hmm. to re- to help reduce the the cost going to the consu- uh, to the consumers, mm-hmm. but it's yeah, it's yeah. way more than what I understand. Mm-hmm. I can just I could I just I mean, I I've, I was in the north in the summertime. I, I went up for seven weeks to work, mm-hmm. and you know, I saw the prices firsthand, and it's like, and I know what it costs here in Ottawa for me to go to the store and buy the same stuff. So there's price gouging going on there, for sure. And I, I absolutely, mm-hmm. in some cases, All yeah, right. most definitely. So, okay, and so uh, I can see why then, and not it, not only because of cultural tradition, but just because of necessity, as you said, uh, subsistence or existence living off the land became a, a very real and, and necessary option uh, for lifestyle. Well, lifestyle, plus, I mean, it's just, it's something, as you know, we, we crave, you know. I, I see. Mm-hmm. I, I crave my my food, my country food. Like, I look forward to having caribou. I look forward to having seal or having mm-hmm. char. Mm-hmm. I can go to the grocery store and buy a steak, but it's not the same as going as being able to have caribou. It's, they're different foods, right? All, all Lots of cultures around the world have different diets and stuff like that, and it's part of our, our of, of our makeup. I mean, it's, it's it's there. It's inside. It's ingrained from your from your earliest memories. I mean, if that's your diet, that's going to be where you find your your taste. I would. It yes. seems very, uh, uh, you know, logical and to me, and also very curious about what those delicacies for us, uh, what they would taste like. Now, um, I'm going to move here a little bit into now. Um, now, you, you found yourself, when you, as you came into adulthood, right away you started working as a crisis intervention worker. And I'm wondering what about, if you think about your upbringing, uh, Trudy, was there something about it that, you, that made you uh, gravitate to this line of work? Did something uniquely qualify you to step up as a crisis intervention worker when you first entered the workforce? I, I don't, I, it's hard to say, nothing really directed from my, from my childhood in a sense. I think, you know, people grow up and they, they, they kind of see, I know in my case, things that you're good at or things that you naturally gravitate towards. Mm-hmm. I'm very much of a social individual and uh, have a lot of compassion for people and people's hardships and um, being able to kind of appreciate or understand where they're coming from, even though I may not have experienced it myself. Mm-hmm. But being seeing other people who I who I know who I'm close to, people in my community, and, and knowing the history and the background and, and how people might get to where they are, mm-hmm. um, having having just that natural intuition, I guess, in a sense of how how to treat people, how to treat our fellow human beings, not just you know in my community, but in general. I see. And I've always been very, I've always been somebody who. Almost, I don't want to say cares too much because I don't think that's right. I don't think, I don't think you can care too much for anybody. Um, but be, being somebody who I'm going to do what I can to help this person, and with with no expectation of anything in turn, other than I want to see them have a better life. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's 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 lovely, truly. So when did you first start facilitating uh, CPI's nonviolent crisis intervention training? Like how and when did that happen? And what were your first uh, impressions of it? Well, I think I was I was certified about 
I think it was in April 2017 I was certified okay. for the first time. All right. And actually, it was quite a surprise to the way it happened. I was just uh, told I was signed up to go to this to do this certification, mm-hmm. and I thought I was just going into a training program where I was the like, I was taking a CPI class mm-hmm. is what I thought I was doing. And actually, when I got on site, I found out I was being certified to oh. now take this back to my workplace. So mm-hmm. it was like that was a bit of a shock for me because I just wasn't expecting it. <laughs> um, so I was certified and then went back to to work after the I think it was two I can't remember the days the trades two to four days, I can't recall what was the certification, the certification training was. Um, four days, and usually. So it's four days, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but at the same time, it's something that's right up my alley mm-hmm. because it's just more information of how, how to uh, treat people in certain in, in, in certain situations, how to respond to, you know, people in crisis in a sense, um, which fell right into everything that I was doing anyway with the work that I was currently doing, but also it kind of um, justified the way that I had been doing things pretty much in my other careers where I was a general manager of a medical boarding home with 47 staff under me. Let's, uh, yeah, let's talk about Larga Baffin. Is that, is that how it's pronounced? I'm sorry. Is that Larga Baffin? Is that correct pronunciation? Yes. Okay, and that's the that's what you're referring to as the general manager, correct? Yes, right. I was the general manager there. I had I think I think uh, I had I started off with maybe six or seven staff, but the company grew fairly quickly, and after 14 years, we were at 47 staff. And um, again, just a part of a part of who I am, being inclusive, not and also you know, wanting the staff to take ownership of their responsibilities and the environment that we were working in. We were taking care of people who were having to travel south for medical services not available to them in the north. I see. So taking them out of their elements, taking them away from their families, taking them away from the culture, taking them away from, you know, their their daily lives and routines. Uh, sometimes it could be parents who may be down for medical issues and they would have to leave their children back at home and having all those worries. And when I say coming south for medical service not available to them in their communities, it's pretty much anything that any of us living in the south would go anything beyond a walk-in clinic is people are coming south for. Okay. It could be high-risk pregnancies. It could be cancer treatment, dialysis treatment. It could be that uh, somebody may have attempted suicide. Um, so now they're coming down and they're in hospitals. And then so they're taken care of by the medical team at the hospitals and stuff, but we would house them and transport them to appointments and stuff like that and then and then feed them uh, throughout their stay. Some people might only be here for a few days, but other people could be here for months on end. So you get to know them. They're a part of, like, you spend more time with them than you do with your own families at home. Mm-hmm. And you see them over and over and over again because, let's say, for a cancer patient, they're for throughout the course of their treatment, which could be two or three years, they're going home for a couple of weeks, but they're spending more time in the South during their treatment periods. Mm-hmm. And you're living with them. I'm not, like, I'm not sleeping in the building overnight, but I'm spending all of my days there otherwise, and they're just not, we're not dealing with just files, right, or people that come and go. Mm-hmm. We're dealing with people that we're practically living with. Um, and you get to know their stories, and you get to know them as individuals, and, um, you know, sometimes, well, a lot of times, obviously, you know, the medical, medic, the the medicine and stuff just doesn't work, and people are not are not able to keep up their fights, and we end up losing them to, you know, they may pass away, they may go home and pass away, they may pass away in the south. So we have that recurring sense of loss, fairly regularly, <laughs> and it took its toll. It took its toll because, you know, I again, I didn't just go into my office and do the paperwork. I was a part of everything and tried to make them feel as much that Larga could be as much of a home for them as possible while they're away from home. Mm-hmm. So it... Um, so that you lasted 14 years there, correct? I was there for 14 years, yes. And so, and after, after that point, I think you, you, in our pre-interview, you said because of, and because of what you've sent me, that because of the effects of post-traumatic stress that you needed to, to move on from that environment. That was a part of it. There okay. was also some politics involved. <laughs> I see. <laughs> but, well, and it was always. after, <laughs> yeah. And, but it was within days of no longer being there. 
that I started feeling the effects of post-traumatic stress because now all of a sudden I'm no longer immersed in dealing with dealing with a lot of different things going on day to day, not just once a day or twice a day, sometimes three or four times a day, mm-hmm. not just with patients but with staff also. I mean, we all have lives away from work, and as much as we try not to bring our lives to work, it's impossible to separate when you walk in that door. So true. So working with staff also who are also part of the community, some of them are part of the community, some of them are like non-Inuit working there also, but dealing with a lot of trauma. And I'm also the type of person that, I'll stop. I'll stop on the side. If, if something is happening as I'm going along, I'm stopping to respond to something. Right. So, kind of be like, if, if there's an accident and there's nobody there, there's no help happening, then I'm the one that's jumping out of my vehicle to help, mm-hmm. while hundreds of people drive by. So I don't know what it is, but things just kind of happen. I, I don't want to think I'm a bad omen, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have. I, I've, I've happened to be in places where people needed immediate assistance. And I would be the kind of like the first person on scene, so having to do what I could until the emergency responders could get there. And I've witnessed things that are not necessarily a part of work, but outside of my work also, that are that have been that were very traumatic. And never taken the time to take care of myself because it was almost like I needed to get through this crisis to get to the next one type thing. And so never stopping to take care of myself. And then when I did stop. All of a sudden, it was like I was away from my support system. I was away from the people where we were supporting each other every day throughout all these things. And then all of a sudden, not have not been around that anymore. And um, taking stock of what had happened over the previous 14 to 20 years of my adult career. And, you know, I just, for some reason, my brain just went to, like, when started thinking about all the things that I had dealt with. Mm-hmm. You know, holding the dead baby witnessing somebody oh fall nine stories from a building and be the first person on site to respond. Okay. Um, coming up on motor vehicle accidents where, uh, you know, I have two or three vehicles in an accident and there's two or three patients in different vehicles and just being angry at everybody else driving by and nobody stopping to help and that sort of stuff, right? And oh. just, so I started thinking about all these things and, yeah, it, t- it took its toll. I mean, I was... Fortunate, I had a very good doctor. I went in and talked with him, and we were able to get. Let's say I was able to find a therapist that I was very comfortable with, mm-hmm. and you know, took care. Finally, took care of myself in a sense, and got some tools to be able to continue to care for myself. And by by, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but because I was able to take care of myself. You I'm healed. now able. I'm, I'm able to continue caring and taking care and doing for other people, mm-hmm. and knowing now when enough is enough for me, or when enough might be enough for them. I see. So after uh, you took that break that you needed to from the Larga Bath and uh, home, and then you uh, you rested for about five months, and that's when you began, I believe, at Ottawa uh, Inuit Children's Center. Is that accurate? Yes. yes? Yeah. And so, um, and that's also where you receive CEPI training, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the center? Okay, so the Ottawa Inuit Children's Center has been in operation for about 20 years. Mm-hmm. We service the Ottawa Inuit community. It's one of two kind of community centers in Ottawa for the Inuit. There's another one that I also worked at in 1997. But at the Ottawa Inuit Children's Center, uh, the name is deceiving because we don't just serve children, we serve families. Mm-hmm. So, And the name is, is being changed to reflect that. There's a Things are happening right now to change the name to show that we're not just about children. But the primary focus was children or is children. And in in order to have healthy, strong children growing up to be healthy, strong adults, we need healthy, strong parents. So I was working in a couple of different on a diff, couple of different files there, and my files were working with the parents of, uh, of children who were receiving services at the Ottawa Inuit Children's Centre. There is several programs, like I don't even know how many programs they have on the go over there anymore, but we have like a daycare program, a preschool program, childcare program. We have a Head Start program where kids are learning their culture and language and up to the age of about six. And then in the same centre, we are one of the, I think, the only center across Canada where children uh, needing to go to junior kindergarten and senior kindergarten 
we actually have those kindergarten classes at our center where they're learning their language, they're learning their culture, plus they're, plus they're learning all the regular curriculum required in Ontario. We have programs for children all the different ages and stages, like after-school programs for kids from 6 to 13-year-olds. Then we have other programs for teenagers and then other programs for youth. And youth at our centers, youth can go up to 29 years old, for example. You don't just, it doesn't end at 18 or 19, it goes until 29. Then we have programs for, you know, for parents. So we have culture drop-ins, we have family drop-ins, we have sewing circles, beating circles, women support circles, men support circles. Uh, we help people navigate this, like any services that they may need to get through in like in the course of their their day or their week or their lifetime type thing like medical services if there's any social services through like children's aid societies court services and stuff like that so we we do everything we can to support them on a day to day basis to see them through whatever their path is at the time to get them to the other end so that they can carry on and lead healthier and happier lives. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about CPI training at the center. Um, One thing that kind of amazes me is the incredible breadth of audiences that receive CPI training. And I know that there are some unique considerations and cultural sensitivities that someone facilitating CPI training for an Inuit group would do well to consider. Could you talk about what some of those are? Yeah, um, uh, I can only speak to the Inuit, the Inuit group itself, but yeah. in Canada we have three indigenous cultures, so Inuit, Métis, uh, sorry, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis, mm-hmm. and, uh, and the three indigenous cultures have all been impacted or witness of a lot of similar things brought into our communities by actions of, let's say, the government, the schools, the churches, and stuff like that over time. So a lot of very similar things, but to keep in mind that they are three distinct cultures. Even though we're all Indigenous, we have three distinct cultures. The Inuit culture has different practices and beliefs and stuff like that than the First Nations culture, for example. And I think in the States, First Nations are known as possibly Indians, I'm not sure, and Inuit may be known as Eskimos. Uh, So that's one important thing right there is that in Canada, we are not known as Eskimos. It's actually offensive, or some people take offense to being called Eskimo. Um, Because I know that there are, are, like the Alaska, I think you call your Alaskan Inuit Alaskan Eskimos, maybe. I'm not, like I know that's the way it used to be. Well, as a child, I certainly heard the word Eskimo and uh, Inuit uh, was not something until much later in life that I ever saw in print or heard. Yeah, and I think most people wouldn't even wouldn't even know what Inuit is because I've, 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 like when I was younger in my teen, like my late teens, when I left home, I was working in the restaurant industry in Mont Tremblant and we would have a lot of American tourists. And if I, if people asked me where I was from or what my background was, and I would say Inuit, they would have no idea. And then when I said Eskimo, they knew exactly. Ah, okay. So, and so that's just something that's, it's, it's becoming more well known that, you know, we don't refer to ourselves as Eskimos, we refer to ourselves as Inuit. I think it's one of the things when I was doing the training and, and just and this is I think just me myself, I'm not the type of person that ha- that likes to have anybody behind me. I feel uncomfortable if I can't see what's going on behind me, for example. Right. So and in a lot of in or in, in the indigenous cultures, we there's there's equality in a circle oh. or a semicircle, for mm-hmm. example. It's nobody wants to be at the front of a room or necessarily at the back or like we're 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 not lined up behind each other. We we stand side by side or sit side by side. Um that's just that's just a natural way when I like when I set up my rooms to do my training, it might not be a circle because, you know, the tables are rectangular or square. So what I do is I set up my tables in a U shape. So I'm at the front of the class, and then I have uh, tables on the side, and it just continues as much as possible into a circle, but the closest we can get is like a a U. (laughs) Uh So that way, everybody is face-to-face. There's nobody behind anybody else, and everybody can see what's going on at the front without having to kind of peer around classes or peer around other people. I mean, that's and for me, that's a comfort thing, and and my my participants have said that they like that set up in the room Mm -hmm. because... It's not like they. It's not like they're 
having to sit in front, like if they're the last ones in the class and then all of a sudden the only place left is the front row, now they have to come sit in the front row, but their personality type, they're not the type of person who wants to be in the front row, for example. So it's a lot easier to just be able to go in and sit at a table that's in a U shape because you're not, you're not being, you're not, you're not being the center of attention. Sure, sure. And for me, it's just that comfort thing. I've I've witnessed too much in my life, and I know of too many too many experiences from other people of of not having my back covered. <laughs> uh-huh. So I I'm, I'm either going to be against the wall or know that there's nothing behind me. The other thing too is recognizing the audience that you are you're facilitating to. Yes. I don't want to be at the front of a class where I'm in like I'm I'm dressed up more than. More than I, more than my participants are. Mm-hmm. I want to be a part of them. So, if I, if I, I know with my audience, they're going to be coming in, you know, with their jeans or, or comfort clothes, as opposed to what some of us might have to wear to the office each day. So, I don't want to put myself on a pedestal and be better than them. I want to be at least equal to them, mm-hmm. uh, so that they feel that comfort with me also. That makes sense. Um, I'm also I'm also delivering to a wide variety of age groups. Like we have our youth staff, our youth staff who are youth themselves. Mm-hmm. So trying to make sure that they 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 can have this comfortable rapport with me, and I'm not I'm not somebody who's more than them or better than them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's that's really important, and also recognizing the different levels that people learn at or different ways that people learn. Some people are very visual. Some people are very by the book type thing. It's, everything has to be in writing for them. Mm-hmm. And just being able to, I, I when, I when we start off, I, because more often than not, I know some, I know most of the staff, not as much now because there's been a, there's been a big hiring, a lot, a lot, there's been, oh my goodness, hang on here. So there's been several new staff hired because there's new programming and stuff like that. So now there are some new faces that I don't know. So when I go into a room with a group that I don't know, I want to get to know them mm-hmm. before I start teaching them. And also they need to get to know me. So I do like, you know, we do a break the ice type thing. So, and it's, it's, I want it to be a casual learning experience because I don't want them to feel that they're there under duress because, yeah, you know what, they're mandated to do this training. I understand you made CPI training a requirement there at the center. Yes, from the top down. And and why did you feel it was so important that you made it a requirement? Um, this goes back to my, my uh, experience as a general manager where, you know, I could send myself, I could go out or send my supervisors out for training and they all have to come back and now they all have to pass this training on to whoever they were supervising, for example. Mm -hmm. Things get lost. They're going to interpret it the way that they learned it. So it might not necessarily interpret the way it's going to, it's going to come, it's going to be different for, for the individuals that they're supervising. So what I did, any and all training that I thought was necessary for me to take and my supervisors to take, my thought was that all my staff have to take the same training so that they're all on the same page. They all hear the same, uh, the same information Mm -hmm. and throughout the discussion and the courses, then that's when they can kind of, uh, you know, go back and forth with their hashing and rehashing of why, which way they're interpreting something so that people can all get on the same page. Mm -hmm. It's no good. And not only that, I just, for me to go do the training and now come back and train out, try and train, you know, almost 50 staff, time-wise, and getting everybody trained in a timely manner so that everything is current and relevant to what's happening at the moment, as opposed to me taking now six six to possibly eight or ten months to try and train 50 staff I because I had to take so many people out of the department and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so just the logistics. And I think it builds ownership. Yes. That they feel valued. Like they're they're getting this training. It's not just for work. A lot of the training, like CPI itself, first aid, all that sort of stuff, it's all transferable skills. It's not just when you're at work, it's when you're at home, when you're out in the community. Um, it just it's it's just it's a part of everything. Did you feel that uh, well said and and, and uh, an observation that we certainly appreciate and believe in? Um, how important, Trudy, do you think CPI concepts are to uh, or how do they jibe well with a, a culture of support and safety? I, I I do believe it does because just again I can only answer to like the people that I'm working with or I'm or I've trained 
and surely, or like with when I when I had my staff doing the CPI at Largabap, and we all they all went through the CPI training. It wasn't through the CPI Institute because I didn't even know CPI or NCPI existed at the time, but it was through another trainer who came in and did a similar idea to CPI training, but she focused it focused it on the workplace itself uh, in a more it was more it's she she does it in a manner where she goes into the workspace she takes true life scenarios and stuff like that from that workplace so it reflected really well with our staff because it wasn't like they were learning things that you know it's like you go to school right you do all this <laughs> you do all this education in science and geometry and history and all that sort of stuff and you grow up and you never use a lot of what you had to learn in school <laughs> So Fair enough. the CPI training being focused on the workplace is really is it's it's really important. And with us and the way that I do it, I could see I could see that I could see it in work right away. How do you like mean? I could hearing conversations. Like oh. one of the things that we learned at uh, when when I had the training done at Larga Bassin, one of the terms that the facilitator used was talking at the water cooler. If you're talking at the water cooler about somebody, you're not talking to them. You're talking about them. Right. So one of the one of the tasks that I that I put my staff to was try and remember when you're talking about somebody, they need to be within earshot. You're not talking about them at the water cooler. And then I was in my office one day, and my door was always open, and then the reception area and stuff was just outside of that office. And one of the staff who, or some of the staff who had gone through the training they were having a conversation about another staff person and then the staff person just said, you're talking at the water cooler. And it's like, wow. <laughs> that and as soon as she, as soon as she said that, the other two recognize it and they say, oh yeah. And just knew that all of a sudden, okay, we need to, we need to change the way that we do things. And it wasn't that they were necessarily talking about somebody in a negative manner, but having a conversation about somebody who's not there. Also, the de-escalation portions of things, uh, just understanding that we deal with a lot of families, you know, who, who, um, and not, not families, but individuals who may be having a hard time and they're coming in and they're, they're carrying the weight of their world on their shoulders coming into our space and anything might trigger them. So recognizing things, being able to respond things in a, in a trauma informed way we deal with, we, 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 we deal with this almost on a daily basis at different levels in our workplaces. I may have, uh, you know, if I was an employee going to work and I had, a, I had an argument at home with my husband, it's not, like I said, I can't just leave that at the door. I'm going to be walking in and I'm carrying this with me. And then somebody else may do something. And I'm going to turn around and snap at them when it has nothing to do with them. But so rewiring people that I'm the type of person that I could have, I could have an issue with an individual and deal with that individual who that might be a very, you know, it might not be a very comfortable conversation that I'm having with them or the way I'm responding to them might, it's directed at them. And then I could turn to the next individual, but leave my feelings and my emotions with the prior incident and not carry it to the next person. So I've, I've always been that way being able to, like, I don't, I don't hold, I don't, um, if I'm angry at you, I'm not going to carry the anger that I have towards you to the next person. So it has nothing to do with the next person. So it's with you. You can rationally detach. Yes. That's a very good way of putting it. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I try to impress on people that I am working with also, uh, and I'm training through CPI. Because people mean, when we're dealing with stressful situations, we get caught up in it and and we we need to keep ourselves at a level where we're not escalating the other individual or the other people who are helping us, our team. Uh, we're not we're not all escalating because now we're feeling re- really stressed out with what's going on, and we just need to be able to make sure that we're able to support each other to better support the person that we are taking care of. Mm, well said. So Trudy, what's What's happening today uh, it, with, between uh, in reconciliation between the Canadian government and the Inuit? Can you and uh, there's something up there called Orange Shirt Day. I think our listeners should know about as well. Yes, I know a little bit about Orange Shirt Day. Okay. Um, I, I, I believe it's September 30th. The date I I don't quite recall the date, but so I don't have it in front in of me nutshell. either. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure, but that's something. Yeah, I. I I got a feeling it's September 30th. Okay. Um, but to put 
everything kind of in a nutshell. Again, from the Inuit perspective, it happened with First Nations and Métis peoples also, but I'm, I'm more informed on the Inuit portion of it. So there were what's known as residential schools in Canada uh, back, you know, they started in the 1800s, I believe it was. The last one actually closed in 1996. And these they were known as Indian residential schools because way back when uh, Inuit were kind of under the same umbrella as First Nations, even though we were distinct and we were separate and we lived in different lands and stuff like that. But the government of Canada, so when it comes to residential schools, what happened is the government of Canada would go into communities and take the children. Oh. And take them away to send them off to school for whatever the school year might be. And they could be as young as five years old. So if, if, if you have children of your own, to put yourself in our community's footsteps, I have a four-year-old granddaughter, actually. So she's turning five in February, which means... Congratulations. And, because, thank you. <laughs> she's so sweet. <laughs> and you are her so TT, is that right? Yeah, she calls me TT. That's nice. I, I don't feel like I'm old enough to be a granny or a grandma. <laughs> <laughs> so the name, the name does it all. <laughs> I see. <laughs> so she's four years old, and she's actually in junior kindergarten. You can start junior kindergarten full days in, in uh, I think, across Canada, but definitely in Ontario, um, if you turn four before the end of the year, for example. So she's in junior kindergarten. After this, she would go to senior kindergarten and then grades, you know, one through, right on through high school, university, or whatever. So if we were if we were living in the in the Arctic 50 years ago, or you know 60 years, 50 anywhere between like 1996, what's that? 22 years ago, um, or living in some some of the more remote uh, indigenous communities, the government would come in and take her, oh. send her off to residential school, and she could be gone then for she would be gone for two or three months possibly come home for Christmas, if I could bring afford to bring her home if I was her mother, she would then go back after Christmas and be gone until May or June and then come home for the summer. Oh, what a this was horrible by no policy. choice. Oh, my God. It's terrible. And no choice to the families. Uh, there are stories of, let's, uh, of, of kids who, when, when the boats and the planes and the cars would come to take them from their families, the kids... Some of the older kids would run away. So they would go and hide, for example, so they wouldn't be taken away that day. Or their parents might hide them. So then if that was happening, then threats were made. Let's say, for example, um, if it was my father who was to go to re- to go off again for the next year at school, when they came in to take him out of the community and he ran away, then my grandfather might be told that, if your son is not here to go back to school with us by tomorrow, you're going to jail. Oh. <laughs> so my so it, it it became an impossible decision, right? Because there might mm. be other people that my grandfather needs to take care of at home, younger siblings, or you know he needs to take care of whatever else there has to happen. So there was no choice but send the child away or or go to jail yourself, for example. What a destructive policy. Very, very much so. There was, and the idea behind the whole residential school, I, I, I feel myself getting worked up, but that's okay, <laughs> was to, it was a coin phrase to take the Indian out of the child. So they were cool. trying to, you know, take away our language, take away our culture. We weren't, like, they would cut our hair. They would, if, if we spoke our language, we, we would be punished. There was, um, food was withheld, for example, or like meager rations. They were almost like labor camps in a way. Like if you, uh, and then the families, like even the siblings would be separated from each other. So you might not see your siblings throughout the school year, but you know that, that they're there somewhere. There was a lot of abuse, sexual abuse, uh, mental abuse, physical abuse. This, this number might shock you. Might, so 6,000 children died in residential schools. Um, oh, that through is various a... means, there would be there would be graveyards on the on on the lands where these children went. They the ones who passed away would be buried and not necessarily marked. They're, we wouldn't like we don't know who's in these graves. And so, what the parents would just be then notified that their child had passed away and was buried somewhere on the yard of the of the school. They they might be notified. They might not know until it was time for the kids to go back home and their child didn't show up, and then they <laughs> might know then. The, and this, um, is, this is not a hundred years ago. This is as recently as I'm just even ashamed. The last to one it. closed in 1996. Okay, 
All right. Yeah. So 22 years ago, my daughter, my daughter is 20. My youngest daughter is 24. I'm sorry. So the last one shut down that. two years before she was born. I'm sorry that you had to see that. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, and we're we're there's there's ripple effects, right? There's generational trauma and stuff like that. Uh, that that is, we're still feeling the impacts today. And um, so, and that's just that's just one thing. That's only the residential schools. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, there's so many more other things that happen, like the dog slaughter. Mm. Uh, in our case, where the government went into the communities and killed all the dog teams. So, like I, I mentioned it earlier, now it cuts off our means of being able to go out and hunt for our food. So now we become dependent on the government to give us food. And in some cases, you know, if it was, like, let's say, the, the women in the community and they needed to go and get, let's say, a bag of flour or a bag of sugar or something like this, then they might get that, but only if they traded sexual favors for it, mm. for example. Mm-hmm. There were, and that was, so that was the resident, and that's, like I said, very brief on residential schools. There's, there, it is a huge, there's been so much impact and ongoing impact. And, you know, as communities and as individuals within the communities, there's a lot happening where we are trying to heal our communities and bring up, bring up our children so that they're, they're not going to be feeling the impacts as much as, let's say, that I may have, that I may have felt with what happened to my father. I mean, there's a certain amount of thing that's going to be passed on to me based on how he parented me. And then it's up to me to carry on what he did, what he went through, or say, you know what? No, it ends with me. I'm not going to let my children feel the impacts of this. So educating them, educating myself, teaching them, they need to know the history. We all need to know the history of what happened because with the way that my father was, up until he passed away 18 years ago, he had issues with alcohol. I mean, he was a highly functioning alcoholic, but there were issues for sure. And, you know, me being younger at the time and not being as nearly as wise as I might be now, I'm not, I'm not wise, wise, but I do know a bit more now than I knew back then, being angry with my father because he was an alcoholic and going to him and it's like, and, and, be, and, and having a, a, pretty heated discussion with him, angry discussion. It's like, why are you always drinking? Why are you always drunk? And his response to me at the time was, so I don't remember. Hmm. And then my response was like, what do you mean? So you don't remember? Like, and then him not being able to say anything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, within a couple of years of him passing away, all of this stuff came out. We had no idea. I had no idea of anything that my father went through because he, he couldn't talk about it. He didn't talk about it, and he wouldn't talk about it because he didn't want us to know what he went through. It was it was shame. It was embarrassment. It was there were so many things. But at the same time, his alcoholism was self medication from the horrific trauma he experienced. Yes, yeah. But at the same time, he got the education, which he also appreciated. But at what expense? At mm-hmm. what cost? Right? right. He didn't teach us our language. Because if he spoke his language as a child at residential school, he would be beaten or, you know, he would, there would be some sort of a punishment. So he never taught us our language. And it's it just, it's, it goes on and on and on. And that's just impacts of residential school. There's impacts of the TB ships. There's impacts of the dog slaughter. There's impacts of relocation where they were, you know, where in my father's case, and actually I won't use my father, I'll use another case that I know of. Uh, I did a, an article on it when I did a cultural industries training program uh, almost 30 years ago. And I know the lady who I did the article on. And so it was relocation. So another thing that happened in Canada for sovereignty, again, was like, like I said, the government went in and they went in and made great promises to some families and stuff like that about um, bringing them to other lands and setting up outpost camps and stuff like that, better hunting, there was food available and this sort of thing. And they could go and try it out for a year. If they didn't like it, they would be brought back to their original community to be with their families again. And the promise of good food and stuff like that, right? Plentiful hunting grounds and stuff like that. And it turned out that a lot of it, all of this stuff, so much of it wasn't true. And what was happening is they were picking people up and they were taking them and relocating them to other communities. But literally just bringing them up, let's say, in a, uh, on a boat and dropping them off on the beach in an area where, like, you know, you're beyond the tree line. There's no trees and there's no there's no shelters and stuff like that. And there might not be any food, like any any uh, animals around that they can hunt. 
And what also happened, and this is really, really, um, like I know, I know these families, I've been to these communities, I've taken care of their descendants and stuff like that. So the government might drop off the father in one area and then take the mother and child to another area. So they would be separated en route. That's outrageous. Yeah. And then the other thing that would happen is like this promise of, well, if it doesn't work out, then we'll bring you back to your homeland, you know, in a year or something like that. They were, some of them have never been back to their homeland and have never seen their families since. Hmm. Uh, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis was brought to the north. We didn't, it wasn't something that was there. It was brought to the north by, you know, uh, whalers and stuff like that. And then a lot of Inuit contracted tuberculosis. So and in order to be, treat, to be treated for tuberculosis, you need to be sent to the south. So ships would go into communities. People would go on to be tested. If you were found to have tuberculosis, then you were shipped out and possibly sent down to asylums in the south. You may die in the south. Your body was never returned. I know another person actually from my home community who's still alive, a very well-known artist, whose father was a part of this. He found his father's body maybe four or five years ago. Oh, my. And his father died when he was a child from tuberculosis, but never knew where he was buried. Yeah, and that's and there's still there are still families who don't know where their where their family member is, where their bodies might be, mm. um, because documents were not you know good documents were kept. There been there I think that one of the sanatoriums had a fire, so a lot of the documentation was destroyed. Which you know that's nobody's fault, but even with that, there's there was just so much disregard, <laughs> so much disregard that we weren't treated as people. You know, even we were put in were put in sideshows and in museums and put on display around the world and stuff like that. And hmm. just, you know, we're people. <laughs> you know, we literally yes. mean the yeah. people. Huh. Okay. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing that with us, uh, uh, Trudy. Um, today, to close, uh, um, let's go to something that uh, we can embrace uh, mm-hmm. and, and something that we can celebrate about your culture. I understand that you are an Indigenous Canadian Master Chef. That is a title that has been conferred upon you. Um, could you talk about some of the favorite dishes that might tempt our listeners or that are that are particular to the Inuit? So our foods, our, the animals that we hunt, the animals and fish that we hunt and catch, are we refer to them as country food. Okay. So caribou, arctic char, seal, narwhal, um, narwhal, clams, scallops, narwhal. Yes, I went narwhal hunting last summer in Kikatarjuak, New York. Do they have a <laughs> horn, don't they, the narwhal? Yes, the unicorn horn, the right. unicorn of the sea. Um <laughs> So and I and I didn't grow up hunting and stuff. Like I said, I left I I left Northern Labrador when I was six years old. So I do remember my father going out hunting with my grandfather and bringing home seal and stuff like that. But I wasn't I wasn't there at an age where I could do the hunting. So I've only start I only started that myself within the last couple of years. I did go narwhal hunting in Kikatarjuak last year, and this past summer I spent seven weeks in Nunavut also, and I went seal hunting for the first time, and Arctic char fishing for the first time. Oh, it must have been a blast. Uh, even, oh, I I just beam inside when I when I think about it because it was just, it was it was like something that I, that was a part of me that I had never done but I always wanted to do. Congratulations. And I've been fortunate enough that I had that opportunity in the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. And I have good friends in these communities that, you know, take me in and take me out and, uh, you know, they're, we're just, yeah, they're, I, I can't even describe how good, how, how closely connected I am with them. And actually, the other thing, too, is so these people that I talk about who are my friends that I go and visit and stay with, they are patients or family members of patients from Larga Baffin. Oh. One family in particular that I'm talking about that I went uh, the narwhal hunting with last year, I met them when they were coming to Largo because their daughter uh, had a brain tumor and she she passed away in 2014 and she was 14 years old, but they were coming for the three years prior for her treatments for the brain tumor. And, you know, just got to know them and really connected with, with her and her parents and they're like good friends. So I would go to there. I just went there and I was like to visit as a People go south for vacation. I go north for vacation. Uh-huh. <laughs> so they took me out narwhal hunting for the first time ever, and it was like, I don't know. I can go on and on. <laughs> okay. And, but, well, so let's what I, go ahead. What I do is I serve that country food. When I when I do catering, I, I don't consider myself a chef, first of all. I always consider myself, I, I've never had any formal training. Okay. I cook at home, and I've always just cooked at home since I was a child. But 
everybody tells me, and, I, and I'm finally accepting it, that, yeah, I do do good food. I know good food. Because I am in Ottawa and I'm so connected with my community and with, and with what goes on here, when I started what I would call, it's, it's catering. I mean, yeah, I'm catering to people. I'm cooking for the masses. Like, my first party was for 500 people. Um, I had never catered before that, and all of a sudden I'm cooking for 500 people. So I will only cater events where I'm talking about promoting or they are somehow involved or being a part of the Inuit community or Inuit culture in a way of education or something like that. I'm not going to go and cater another event that has nothing to do with Inuit. That's just not. I don't do it as a job. I do it as an educational experience. Right. And to share the food, to share our food so that, you know, one day you may be able to go to the store and buy caribou. Right now you can't. You have to order it from the north, um, from hunters and trappers and stuff like that. You can go and buy Arctic char in a store, but it's farmed Arctic char, char, which is very different than the fresh-caught Arctic char that I fished for last year Mm -hmm. or this past summer. So, yeah, I've uh, I've done some pretty significant events, and uh, in the last two or three years, it's because of all the stuff that's going on and all this, all the residential schools and truth and reconciliation and stuff like that. There's a lot of indigenous events going on and to be culturally appropriate, they can't have non-indigenous people out there catering these events. So they do, they, they have reached out to the communities and I am one of the only Inuit chefs (laughs) Mm -hmm. in Southern Canada. All right like all across the South pretty much. And in Ottawa, I mean, Ottawa, there's a lot of stuff going on here. We are a government town. We are where Parliament is, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I've done a lot of stuff on Parliament Hill itself. And then, you know, last year, Canada turned 150 years old. And there was this big event on the Hill for it called A Taste of the North. And I work with them to feed these 7,000 people. I didn't necessarily do all the cooking, but I got all the food down here. I met with the chef who was making some of the uh, dishes and stuff like that to you know, talk to them about what, how to serve it. And I also did cooking demonstrations with Vic, uh, with uh, Vic Room Vidge. So, and, you know, this past summer, well, we had the Indigenous Summer Solstice every summer here in Ottawa. And last year I was one of the future chefs for that. And we fed $3,000 in a couple of days, or 3,000 people, I mean, over the course of a couple of days. So people are becoming more and more aware of the Indigenous cultures through these events. And because of Truth and Reconciliation, which happened uh, through Ma- Ma- Marie Sinclair. There's a, there's this whole movement now for truth and reconciliation with the indigenous peoples, and I'm I'm we're right on the cusp of that. And being a part of it is really exciting. You know, one of the things that happened at the hill last year is a family came up, but a, a mom came up and she had three children with her, and you know she was trying to tell them that it was like a beef stew that they were having. Uh, because she didn't want to tell them it was caribou because she figured they wouldn't eat and she wanted them to eat. So I stood there and it's like, no, it's not beef stew. I'm not going to tell them it's beef stew. You're lying. You're here to learn. This is a part of the learning experience. It's caribou stew. It's better than beef stew. The kids tried it and they kept coming back for more. And I think she got the idea that, yeah, you're taking you're taking something away from me. <laughs> you know, don't don't take away a part of who I am, what my makeup is. I wouldn't take it away from you. Don't continue doing what was done to us for the last hundred years. Mm. So you know, just one on one conversations mm-hmm. like that, right? Educate one person at a time. So incremental progress in the reconciliation is what you're a part of, and a and a light uh, there uh, for the community. Yes. Yes. Well, that's a great thought yeah. to to close with today. Unless you have something you would like to final thought you'd like to share with us today, Trudy. No, but I appreciate uh, you taking the interest and reaching out to me, and uh, I I feel really good about the CPI program. I think it's something that's really important, and if there is a way that we could reach everybody who who deals with anybody, and we all deal with people in our everyday lives, just learning something and making it available so that people are able to do it, just use it in their everyday lives. When they're out there on the side of the street or in the grocery store and they see something happening, they can respond to it in an appropriate manner. Fantastic. Thank you for that thought, Trude. My guest today has been Trudy Metcalf. Uh, She is uh, a parenting program coordinator, now semi-retired. I think she still does some training at the Ottawa Inuit Children's Center and, and a CPI certified instructor, of course. Thank you so much, Trudy. Thank you, Terry. I really appreciate it. Oh, our, our privilege. And thank you all for listening.
Thank you for joining us today on Unrestrained. Tune in again soon for another interview with an expert in behavior management. Until then, this is your host, Terry Vitone, hoping your intention is prevention. <laughs>